Good afternoon, everybody. Today we are deviating a little bit from our planned lecture that's on the syllabus because today we are going to discuss uh, three epidemics that happened here in New Orleans. Bubonic plague, the influenza outbreak of 1918, and yellow fever. Each of these epidemics vastly transformed not only the daily goings-ons in the city, they transformed our healthcare systems, our economy, the housing situations, and also our interactions with one another. So I will start the slideshow in just a moment. And this first slide I'm gonna show you is a crew of lab workers examining dead rats in New Orleans, 1914. Notice the lack of protective gear, gloves, face masks, etc. cetera. Uh, quite disturbing, perhaps. Uh, but yes, this is the same plague that killed 100 plus million people in Europe and in Asia throughout the 12th century. And as the story goes, on June 28th of 1914, a 48-year-old Swedish sailor arrived here in New Orleans uh, with a fever. He was rushed to Charity Hospital, uh, isolated where he soon died alone and surrounded by strangers in a foreign land. Uh, the autopsy confirmed that the cause of death was bubonic plague. Uh, the Black Death was here in New Orleans. And once upon a time, this plague was considered an old world disease and recession throughout most of Europe's contact with the Americas. Changes came in the 1800s as rat populations were able to uh, get on faster moving and more frequently crossing the ocean ships. Uh, it was just a matter of time before infected fleas would find suitable hosts in their habitat, their new habitat. Uh, the first cases in the Western Hemisphere was in Brazil. Uh, 1899, then San Francisco, 1900, Puerto Rico and Cuba in 1912, and of course all of these cities are trading partners with New Orleans. Uh, city and state officials launched preemptive rat trapping campaign in June of 1912. Uh, they did catch an infected rat on the docks between Napoleon and Louisiana Avenues. Uh, however, no other specimens were found. For two more years, uh, people were, the authorities were having a bit of relief. Uh, however, they were wrong. Uh, a second case appeared in New Orleans the day after that sailor died. Uh, August 1914 was the peak of the outbreak. Uh, however, what could have been just an absolute disaster at the worst moment in the history of the city uh, became a resounding public health success. Federal, city, state authorities took early signs of this plague very seriously, launching uh, heavy-handed even. Uh, efforts to stop the plague. They uh, quarantined people. They burned furniture in the streets. Uh, infected patients were sent to a special contagion ward uh, and treated with newly devised anti-plague serums. Uh, and for the other 350,000 residents of the city, a three-prong prevention strategy was enacted, uh, reducing the rat population through massive trapping campaign, uh, finding and destroying nesting and, and breeding Bozy centers, uh, and transforming the cityscape to separate rats and humans as much as possible. Army of workers swept across the city uh, and just went one week inspected uh, 3,500 rail cars, 4,200 buildings, uh, fumigated ships, uh, trapped approximately 20,000 rodents, laid 300,000 plus poison traps throughout the city, uh, discovering 17 uh, infected rats. Uh, workers recorded the data of where these rats were found, uh, and then the, they would just be a scorched earth campaign of fumigation, burning, uh, even in some cases just completely leveling. The building next door to the city's campaign headquarters was demolished for this reason. Uh, tactics like this went on for weeks, months, uh, ground zero in the geography of this uh, of the rats. 
was, of course, the docks um, when the first one was just a few years prior. Cases abated by the year's end, but the campaign carried on to the next year. The city passed ordinances for rat proofing of buildings, codes were put into place, uh, and human levy, making uh, human living spaces raised up above ground, uh, which we all, most people did here for flooding reasons, but old shanty towns like the ones that you see here were mostly demolished. Uh, other codes passed in 1915 regulated the raising of animals within city limits, uh, mandated the use of closed garbage cans. You have to close your garbage can. Um, and it did, the plague didn't end all at once in New Orleans. It just petered out. Uh, human death in 1919 led to the uh, redeployment of the 1914 strategy. It's equally successful, and by the 1920s, New Orleans was declared plague-free. Um, because of the rigor of the campaign, uh, this 1914 outbreak was limited to 30 deaths, and I'm sorry, 30 cases and 10 deaths. Uh, so possibly thousands of people were saved from illness and death. Uh, pragmatically, this had a wonderful economic boom to the city because just as World War I is ramping up and America's about to get involved, New Orleans plays a key role in the deployment of troops. The Naval Facility, uh, Quartermaster Depot, uh, Port Modernization, all of which created jobs here in New Orleans, uh, created valuable new infrastructure, uh, quantities of materials heading to the front, uh, had overwhelmed the nation's rail systems, uh, forced federal government to reinvigorate uh, the inland waterway system. Uh, obviously, this benefits New Orleans. The river is being used more and more for deployment. Uh, the 1914 campaign served as a model to control similar outbreaks elsewhere. So for once, uh, New Orleans was at the forefront of positive innovation here. Uh, our war, the bubonic plague could not have been won though if all public and private sectors as well as citizens were not united against this common enemy. Uh, New Orleans has endured outbreaks of cholera, malaria, smallpox, uh, but in 1918 uh, this disease was sweeping across Europe killing more American soldiers than the war. Um, yet in the evening newspaper on page 10 of the New Orleans states uh, there's a three paragraph story headline, No Danger of Spanish Influenza Epidemic Here. Uh, in 1918, a strain of pandemic influenza swept the globe three times, infecting millions, killing 5% of the world's population. Uh, influenza patients uh, succumbed to the disease in as little as 12 hours, suffering from intense uh, secondary pneumonia, uh, turning patients blue as they suffocated from lung hemorrhage. Uh, perhaps more alarming, uh, the 1918 uh, influenza struck the young and healthy people the hardest. Uh, patients between the ages of 15 to 34 uh, were dying at a rate of 20 times higher uh, than previous influenza epidemics. Among the uh, women or to people to die was my great grandmother, uh, Mary Louise Terrell Grayson. Here she is right here. She died uh, at age 25. Also dying with her were two infant twin daughters. Uh, my grandfather, who was about two years old at the time, uh, did survive. Uh, the origins of this flu, uh, it will, it's assumed that it started at a swine farm in Kansas in January of 1918. Uh, and this virus jumped from livestock to humans. Uh, it could have been contained perhaps within this local population, but nationwide mobilization in response to the United States entering World War I meant that uh, military camps uh, were ubiquitous and population movement intensified. So influenza was transported uh, to Camp Funson in Kansas, where it spread to other camps, other towns, and then throughout the world. Uh, on August 27th of 1918, uh, the Pan American oil company tanker Harold Walker left Boston for Mexico. Uh, en route to Mexico, uh, the steamer's crew engine began to fall ill, uh, with at least three sailors dying at sea. Uh, Harold Walker stopped here in New Orleans on September the 16th. Uh, City Board of Health was notified that there was flu. 
on the ship. They were uh, ordered to drop anchor in the middle of the Mississippi. Uh, three more sailors died uh, on the way to Louisiana, uh, including 17-year-old New Orleans native uh, John James Louis Hoffman. Uh, after docking, four men were transported to Charity Hospital for treatment. Uh, hours after that transport, the captain of the Harold Walker requested 10 more of his crew be hospitalized. Uh, and around September 18th, the United Fruit Company tanker, uh, Metaphon, arrived in New Orleans from Panama. Uh, it had influence on board, 51 soldiers, 50 civilians, 86 crew, um, 11 were ill with the flu, with influenza. Uh, some soldiers were on board as well being transported. Uh, the ship was quarantined, but only for 24 hours because the ship had perishable bananas that would spoil if left for much longer. Uh, cargo was unloaded uh, and the flu spread. Interestingly enough, the United Fruit Company, some of you may know this, owned by the Zamuri family, uh, is the precursor to Chiquita bananas, which we're all familiar with, but also the Zamuri family donated much money to Tulane. Uh, I believe there's a Zamuri residence hall, but the, the president's house right there on Audubon in St. Charles was once the Zamuri family home. 1918, though, public health officials in Louisiana expected this new strain to spread to New Orleans, but some presumed that the hot climate uh, would work in our favor. Uh, this is, of course, tragically false. Uh, pandemic peaked in New Orleans from mid-September to mid-November. Uh, in the U.S., only Pittsburgh and Philadelphia had higher rates of infection than New Orleans. Uh, October 1st. British steamer sailing to, uh, sorry, from Bermuda to New Orleans uh, with 56 influenza cases on board arrived. Uh, they were transported to Charity Hospital. Um, the Red Cross, though, was prepared for this in ways uh, that was surprising almost uh, because they were prepared for uh, war efforts some war relief. Uh, but they were heavily staffed. Uh, hospitals were supplied. Uh, fraternal organizations were poised to do their part for the war effort, uh, which translated into do, doing their part to fight the flu. Uh, all citizens were called upon to purchase liberty bonds, to conserve commodities like gasoline, to be vigilant. Uh, and in the first days of October of 1918, the Red Cross pledged to make 50,000 face masks for use of in, in, influence awards throughout New Orleans. Uh, state and municipal public health officials uh, instated uh, mandatory reporting for influenza. Uh, of course, it was a bit insufficient at first. Uh, on the single day of October 8th, more than 2,000 new cases of influenza were reported, though. Uh, public gatherings were banned, streetcars came to a halt, uh, food shortages did become a reality. Uh, on October 15th, Dr. J.M. May, May he perhaps is the way to pronounce this, died of the flu. Dr. May was a nerve specialist, not an infectious disease doctor. However, he left the safety of his private practice to care for flu victims at Toro Hospital. He is buried today in St. Louis Cemetery number three. Finally though, in December, as the disease is making its third and final trip around the world, Charity Hospital is once again dedicated entire, uh, to the entirety of the care of influenza patients. Uh, the severity of the third epidemic was not as severe as previous ones uh, in the city uh, concluded in February of 1919. And during the fall and winter epidemics of 1918, though, uh, 54,000 people in New Orleans contracted the flu, 14% of the population of the entire city. Uh, 3,489 of these people died of their illness and were buried in family tombs, wall vaults, or in the vast unmarked graves of Charity Hospital Cemetery on Canal Street. Anytime you visit one of New Orleans cemeteries or really any cemetery in the world, you will see numerous people with a death date of 1918. This brings us to our final plague that visited New Orleans regularly, yellow fever. Nearly every summer, 
yellow fever arrived in New Orleans. Uh, and without doubt, New Orleans residents died of yellow fever throughout the 18th century. However, 1796 is considered to be the year of the first significant outbreak in New Orleans. Uh, and as we've previously discussed in the class, early New Orleans went for extended periods of time without significant contact from its mother country, France. Spanish Louisiana did experience an increase in trade with other Spanish colonies, but by the end of the 18th century, New Orleans was on the cusp of becoming a major global port city with an extensive trade network reaching throughout the world. Between 1796 and 1905, yellow fever killed over 100,000 Louisianians and approximately 40,000 New Orleanians. And as we are learning today, these outbreaks affect the economy, human interactions, perceptions of peoples and places, and seasonal migration patterns. By this, I mean when and where you move. So for example, none of you were expecting to leave campus when you did. You were going to be here until May. Perhaps you were going to stay in New Orleans to work this summer at a job. Who knows? But you left in March. You moved, an entire population of people moved to other parts of either the city or the country from New Orleans that was not expected to move in May. This changes, this place is, just changes things, puts people in places where they were not supposed to be. This also means that you might be moving somewhere this summer that you were not planning on moving. In its annual appearances though, just about annual, uh, at least 30 extensive outbreaks uh, spread over uh, the centuries, this one century just about, the, the 19th century. Sometimes referred to as Yellow Jack, uh, destroyed thousands of lives, cost millions of dollars, affected almost every aspect of human affairs within its sphere of influence. And that, of course, is economic, social, political, intellectual, medical, spiritual, the religious communities, the crises, and all of them. Uh, ultimately, though, got my notes a little mixed up here, sorry. Uh, medical science, uh, public health uh, operations triumph over yellow fever. Uh, but it took a lot longer than would be expected because of uh, misunderstandings of this disease. What is yellow fever though? It's an infectious disease that occurs primarily in tropical, subtropical zones. Uh, and it's a virus. And this is gruesome. I apologize. Uh, it's transmitted from person to person by the female adiasic uh, Egypti mosquito. Uh, this mosquito feeds on the blood of a yellow fever patient and then goes on after an incubation period to bite someone else. Uh, that person is an infected. And the illness begins with a fever uh, and chills. Temperatures can reach 102, 103 degrees. Uh, in the first two to five days, patients experience nausea, vomiting, constipation, uh, headaches, muscular pain, uh, later jaundice, yellowness uh, of the skin appears, uh, along with passive hemorrhages from almost every part of the body. You just bleed through your eyes, through your ears, through your nose. There's some stories of people's toes bleeding. Uh, and finally, when the end is near, the black vomit. Uh, blood from hemorrhages within the stomach mixes with stomach acids, and the resulting product is this black vomit, which is described as appearing uh, coffee grounds. Um, then comes convulsions or a coma. Uh, death is often the result of damage to the liver or kidneys or both or recovery may begin within two or one or two weeks afterwards. Recovery is possible, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But in 1853, New Orleans experienced its most devastating yellow fever epidemic. Uh, at least 8,000 people died, uh, especially Irish and German immigrants. Uh, during the outbreak, the city streets were just mostly deserted, uh, at first, local press underreported the severity of the outbreak to avoid disruption of commerce. Other papers in different parts of the country are reporting on New Orleans and the, um, the yellow fever down here, but our papers are downplaying it, undoubtedly costing lives. Uh, interesting on the side note here, there was no significant outbreaks of yellow fever during the Civil War due to the decrease in the port traffic uh, and efforts of Union soldiers to clean the city. 
course, when the city went back to civilian control in uh, 1866, uh, cholera stuck, stuck twice, uh, and yellow fever killed approximately 3,000 people. This is a little hard to read, but you can see that this is a grave of a person who died in 1853. Three years, three months, 20 days, William Anderson. Uh, during the second half of the 19th century, yellow fever outbreaks began to diminish. Uh, there is constant threats of the disease, um, but it was eliminated finally in 1905. The discovery of the yellow fever's transmitter, the, the mosquito, uh, in 1901, 1905, by the United States Army Commission in Cuba, um, helped discover that it, they discovered that it was transmitted by mosquitoes. But 1905, the nation's last yellow fever ep epidemic killed 400 people here in New Orleans, uh, mostly Sicilian immigrants living in tight quarters, uh, actually in the lower part of the French Quarter. Uh, better drainage and potable water systems helped eliminate the scourge on the city. I should like to note, though, that uh, in 1905, Tulane's football season was mostly canceled, and uh, New Orleans Archbishop Chappelle died. Uh, and in a, new, in a Catholic city like New Orleans, that, that is very upsetting. Uh, and while there are multiple outbreaks in New Orleans history, we're going to concentrate on, on 1853. Uh, in the 50s, 1850s, of course, pestilence killed over 18,000 New Orleanians. Uh, but by 1850, people are starting to think that it's no longer something to worry about. Outbreaks are becoming less common. Uh, by 1850, it's nothing to be feared, people are thinking. Uh, the editor of the New Orleans Medical and Surgical Journal uh, said, quote, the yellow fever, the dread of the stranger and sojourner in our midst has long been banished, banished from our city. Yet, in the summer of 1853, uh, with frequent rains, uh, excessive heat coming down uh, from the sun, uh, the sanitary conditions of the city were not good at best. Uh, newspapers regularly complained about the uh, filthy streets, uh, repeatedly denouncing the city government and the, and the uh, sanitation commissions for neglecting their duties. Uh, in May of 1853, the earliest cases appeared um, at Charity Hospital, but some physicians uh, who viewed the cases disagreed, saying, no, they, these people, they're not yellow enough. Uh, the black vomit's not uh, black enough. It was very serious denial going on here. Uh, so some said it's May. It doesn't show up until July or something. This can't be it. But finally, on June 10th, um, a young Irish woman uh, who lived on Chapatula Street uh, arrived at Charity Hospital, uh, providing them with the uh, proof they needed that yellow fever was here. Uh, and from May to early June, uh, steady progress of the fever, still receiving little publicity. But finally, uh, the Orleanian newspaper in July 13 admitted uh, the existence of yellow fever, uh, but still discounted its uh, importance. Uh, by July 16th, fever claimed over 300 lives. Word is spreading. Citizens are fleeing New Orleans by the thousands, those who could, of course. That's, uh, that is a, a wealthy person's option to leave, to go to the coast, to go perhaps up north, somewhere like this. But uh, by this time, entire families are dying. They're dying faster than graves could be dug. Uh, in order to speed up the process, grave diggers uh, are resorting to, um, to digging up long ditches, just 20, 18, 24 inches deep, tossing these coffins with a little bit of dirt over it. Of course, you know how it rains here in New Orleans. This rain is gonna wash away these thin coverings of dirt. Uh, therefore, the coffins were just exposed to New Orleans' terrible heat, uh, and more rain, more heat. Uh, these putrefying bodies are just bursting through these cheap coffins, filling the air with just unbelievable odors. Uh, in August, uh, usually the hottest month here, right? Uh, mortality reached uh, incredible numbers. Uh, 900 the first week, 1,200 the next, and the next uh, two weeks were 1,300 people dying each week. And of course, the city council had adjourned uh, until October, leaving the city with no government, really. Uh, some city council members left the city. Uh, they were 
received, uh, rightfully so, they, they received harsh criticism from the local newspaper. Um, it's so serious that even the French inhabitants, who were often the last people to fear the disease, we'll get to that in a minute, uh, they're becoming alarmed. Uh, French newspapers are attributing the fever's uh, increase to the nauseous, uh, noxious uh, effluvia emanating from the gutters and from the graveyard, with these rotting, half-buried corpses everywhere. Uh, in mid-August, the mayor, which remember, we still don't know where this disease comes from, ordered that 400 rounds of cannon be fired daily at sunset uh, at various public squares uh, and in, in an attempt to kind of purify the air, you know, the, all the, this, uh, the barrels of tar were burned at the streets and in the cemeteries. Uh, and you can imagine what this scene was like. This does not cure, or this does not cure you of yellow fever. This does not purify the air. It actually kind of started working though because mosquitoes, as you probably know, don't like smoke. So they moved on from there. Uh, Halloween day of that year, October 31st, numbers are dropping sufficiently that the Board of Health uh, declared the epidemic at an end uh, and assured uh, absentees and strangers a uh, safe entry back into the city. New Orleans in 1853 had a population of approximately 159,000 people. That included about 5,000 transients. Uh, supposedly, almost one-fourth of the population fled when the fever arrived, leaving about 125,000 people here. Therefore, the fever claimed about one in every 15 person remaining in the city. A total of approximately 29,000 cases and at least, at least 8,000 deaths. This is 28% fatality rate. Uh, and this is the story of the worst epidemic in New Orleans history. Uh, socially, there's much more to it. Uh, today, of course, there is a vaccine that will prevent yellow fever. Uh, but back in the day, though, the only way to develop immunity was to survive. Uh, as a result, there was a sort of social hierarchy in New Orleans around who was acclimated and who was unacclimated. Uh, employers often wouldn't hire people who were not acclimated. Uh, women would not marry men who were not acclimated. You could not live in certain neighborhoods because people would not rent rooms to the unacclimated. Uh, certain social circles excluded you. And this created a hierarchy of people. Um, and they, this created a hierarchy of people and there are people wanting to actually get themselves infected so that they could then claim that they were immune. Uh, so there's no physical way really to tell if someone's acclimated. They just had to find ways to demonstrate that they were. Uh, that often involves showcasing how deep your ties were here in New Orleans. People who had grown up in the city were more, li more likely to have contracted a mild case as a child. Therefore, they were often considered acclimated. I don't know how true that is. Um, the city's European immigrants who hadn't been here, uh, been around this virus before, uh, they were considered the biggest liabilities. Uh, they often arrived in New Orleans uh, with already compromised immune system, lived in neighborhoods, uh, packed upon one, one another. And that's the reason yellow fever was often nicknamed the stranger's disease. Uh, immigrants were flocking to the city. Uh, people came from far and wide to try and break into this booming economy that we have with on going on here, you know, that live that dream of perhaps owning land themselves, perhaps owning enslaved people. Uh, but first, they had to prove they're not going to just die. Uh, and some immigrants, like I said, wanted to get sick, uh, give themselves a kind of, kind of an edge. Uh, it's important in this social hierarchy. Uh, you know, you were an undocumented stranger or you were an acclimated citizen. Uh, and there's tons of myths just nonsense floating around on how to protect yourself or who was most likely to die from it so these like old wives tales uh that people who eat too many tomatoes if you eat too much fruit you'll get the uh yellow fever and others said if you don't eat enough fruit you'll get it uh it was absurd uh, but the most prevalent myth uh was that african americans could not get yellow fever. They were immune by nature. Uh, many prominent doctors throughout the South uh, spread the lie, this misinformation that black people had a natural immunity 
to yellow fever, uh, therefore creating further justification of slavery. So that I mean, if a black person was naturally resistant to yellow fever, African slavery is natural, even humanitarian perhaps, because it protects the white population, keeping them away from areas um, in which they are endangered. Uh, so the belief that African Americans could work outside in hot, swampy areas uh, that are just prone to yellow fever was fine because they were not at risk of contracting the disease. Right. Uh, advocates of slavery argue that God had made the black person immune. Africans were immune and therefore we white people can expand our economy. Uh, it's to save white people from death. So here's the thing. Back then, they knew, many people knew that African Americans were not immune. They died from it as well. Uh, at slave markets, there were few buyers who were willing to uh, purchase a human who had not, was not acclimated. That is why the idea of the Creole slave uh, became prevalent. A Creole slave was supposedly acclimated and therefore immune and a better purchase. Uh, acclimated slaves sold 25 to 50 percent more, or that much more, sorry, than an unacclimated slave person. Uh, so, as if the idea of a disease that kills thousands of people uh, scapegoats immigrants uh, and it upholds white superiority as an Diseases that cause suffering on a widespread scale can also be used to justify prejudices. So other examples, HIV, that is a gay person's disease, or Haitians, or intravenous drug users, uh, Ebola, that, that uh, unearthed a lot of prejudices against Western Africans. Uh, the opioid crisis here in the United States, that is uh, exclusively the problems of rural, poor, white people. Today, we are fighting a Chinese virus. And one final event I will mention before we sign off here uh, is the cholera outbreak in New Orleans of 1833. Uh, shortly after the disaster, seven doctors here in New Orleans got together, they decided to train students and founded the Medical College of Louisiana. Uh, the mission of this college was to train doctors to combat cholera and yellow fever. Several years later, in 1847, the Louisiana State Legislature added a law school to the college and it was renamed uh, the University of Louisiana. It was a public university at the time. And as some of you might know, the school grew and grew and in 1884, Paul Tulane donated over $1 million to the university. And here we are today. So I hope you're all staying well. I will have another lecture on Wednesday. I have the office hours, which I'm changing the hours to noon, just this one Wednesday at least. Uh, I will put this in an email. And email me if you have any questions.